Well, hello, everyone. Welcome to another edition of the latest Shiny Podcast. This is your host, Stephen Spector. Uh, with me, as always, Rob Hirschfeld. Good afternoon, Rob. Stephen, good afternoon. We have a great open source lady with us today, and I'm really excited. Uh, we worked together at HPE a number of years ago. You know, this will be a great podcast. It's really going to focus on open source. And so let me introduce our guest, uh, Vicki Brasseur, and hopefully I said it correct, who is currently the Vice President for the OSI, the Open Source Initiative. Vicki, thanks for joining us. Well, thanks for having me, guys. Before we get going, maybe 30-second kind of overview of your background so that our, our podcast listeners get an idea of where you come from, and then we'll jump in. Where I come from ranges far and wide. I've got a approximately 30 years of experience of some sort or other with uh, free and open source software. Now that's what I get paid to do for a living on a freelance basis. Um, I have led software engineering departments at the uh, VP director level in the past as well. So I've got a lot of technical cred, but really where I spend all of my time and where I love spending my time is helping companies understand and release and contribute to uh, free and open source software in the way that's good for their bottom line, but also is good for the community. That's an interesting thought. So how do you, so if you're helping a company that is basically involved in open source or wants consuming or producing? All of the above. Um, okay. What I find is, is that uh, people come to me with one need for in their free and open source software. And frankly, to be honest, almost 100% of the time, they don't know why they're doing it. Aside from, you know, all the big players are doing open source software, so we should do open source. So we're going to do open source, and that's going to be great. And the very first question I have to get answered and help them to answer, because I can't answer this myself, this is, this is them, is why? Why do you want to do this? What do you want to get out of this? Because if you don't have a goal in what you're going to do to contribute to or release or participate in free and open source software from a business perspective, then you will never know whether you're succeeding. You will just continue using resources and time and flailing away without seeing any return on your investment, right? Because you don't know where you're going to head and you don't know what you want to get out of it. So that's the question that we almost always have to answer first. And that's, that takes mm. the majority of the time because after that, it's often a lot easier to get them to that goal. Usually they don't understand free and open source software very well or the philosophies behind it or uh, anything about community. In the process of coming up with their goals, I get to slowly but surely introduce them to these other concepts. So by the time we have the goals, they're a lot more familiar with it and it makes it more likely that they can be successful and meet their goals. Plus, they now have a very strong appreciation for what makes free and open source software so important and so innovative. And that's going to be the people. And without understanding that and how to interact with people in a, an authentic, community-focused way, you won't see any positive effect on your bottom line. So you have to participate in the community in a very authentic way. So it's Rod not just dumping. They can't just dump their software into, into, the, into the wilderness and, and abandon it and expect good things to happen. Exactly. I mean, it's it's definitely not a if you release. I say it, that, I, 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 I'm saying that tongue in cheek, and and yet it, it sounds like your experience and my experience too is people think that that's exactly what's going to happen with open source. Well, yes, but that's they also expect that's going to happen with their general products, right? If if we release mm. this amazing new product, somebody's going to want it. Well, that's not the way it works. You have to figure out their needs and then meet their needs and then communicate that hey wave a big flag, look, we've got something that's going to help you, right? It's just like open source software. You can't just throw something over the wall and expect a community to instantly form around it. This isn't like you're throwing a piece of bread into a pool of minnows. They're not all going to come around to eat from your cute little piece of bread just because it's there. So you do have to do a lot more work if you want to be successful. Oh boy, there's so many, I'm like, I'm like dazzled by all the, all the exciting topics for us. When you're doing that, you're, you're, you know, there's a marketing component. A lot of people consider marketing evil in open source. Do you sort of, is that fair? It, you know, how much marketing well, is, is okay for an open source project? I think that's unfair to say that it's just open source people. I think across all of technology and it, even beyond technology, but because that's where I spend all my time and you spend all of your time. I mean, it's just this, this bigotry and bias against 
marketing. Um, and I think it comes from uh, marketing itself has become equated with advertising and advertising is now very invasive and has been for many years. And we don't like that, justifiably so. We shouldn't like that, our privacy matters. Just marketers have gotten a really bad rap over the years and people haven't bothered to understand what marketing actually is. And so we're biased against it. What can you define marketing actually is? Well, marketing is discovering the needs of your market. Who is your market? Discover that first and then discover the needs of your market. And then that's a com separate component from the outreach, which is more of the advertising. So if you don't do appropriate marketing, then you're going to be building the wrong product for the wrong people at the wrong time, and you're going to kind of fail. So marketing is very important on the incoming side. And then you also have the outgoing side, which is the outreach. And that's the side that everybody considers all of marketing because that's the most visible side. That's going to be the advertising. Marketing is actually a fairly complex thing that we in technology don't understand and we haven't gone out of our way to understand. Once I did so, it's probably one of the best things I've done for my career is understanding what marketing really is and how it can be very important to my team and to my company to become successful. How do you convince people in this conveying the marketing message to actually be pragmatic about what the open source project is doing because um, one of the things that you're everything you're describing immediately comes back to me putting on you know my battle scars from from corporate open source involvement where it's the the, the brag is so big that right that's that's how they're marketing that's it's, it completely undermines everything you just described but they're it, saying i've got a i've got a in this like I would a normal product and promise the moon and that's not that doesn't feel open source to me well that obviously it is open source because you experienced it in open source <laughs> it's it's not like open source is special from that point of view it's still composed of people and people still have their own particular motivations um, and they're coming from all sorts of different perspectives in that way and so for some people that is open source but to others of us that's that's not Right. And so you do have to continually come back to get, get open source out of it completely. Open source is a means to an end for your company. So what is that end? Keep coming back to that. What is your goal? What is your goal? And if you're able to come back to your goal and determine what that is and then figure out how open source and openness can help you reach that goal and what you can do, the, the discrete steps within free and open source software. Is it contributing? Is it releasing? Is it supporting through financial things? Is it any of these, all of these? I don't know what that is. And you're not right. going to either if you don't know what your goal is. You're just going to be spending money and time willy-nilly without having any sort of goal. And if you don't have a goal, you can't be authentic. You can't know what you're trying to do. And so you do get that sort of crappy outreach. You're describing something, and I, I want to. I'm going to make it incredibly obvious because you're implying something that I, I, I think I strongly agree with, which is there isn't a goal. <laughs> it is your goal in each project's case or each company's case when they're participating. There isn't a the open source goal is X. Every everybody's got their own their own reason for doing it. And so, Absolutely. but your 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 consulting component is that discovery is step one. That is absolutely step one. And I actually, I spoke at OzCon the other week. I, I spoke twice, but the second talk was all about how to release an internal open source project. And overall, it was really well uh, received and I got great reviews and that was lovely. But there was one person, and this is the person that keeps coming up all the time, this type of person. All they wanted was for me to give them the spoon fed bullet point list of here is exactly how you do it. Right. And that list doesn't exist. People who believe that list exists are always looking for the shortcut way to do things. And there is none. You want to be successful, you have to do the hard work. And that includes thinking it through. What is your strategy for doing this? And what is your goal? I, and I, I'm resisting, like, because we do an open source project, and, and I'm going to use that as reference, and I'm resisting the free consulting from you. <laughs> but. I have a lot of battle scars from OpenStack days, from Kubernetes days, right? We've initiated this project called Digital Rebar. And one of the things I've seen through in all those projects is this idea that people want to show up in a project and basically 
access the project and the support of the team who's building it for free. To what extent is that, you know, do, do companies build walls? You know, that's not, the, you know, giving away free software. It's not the software that's free. It's people's time and support and the building an authentic community all take investment. How do you, how do you talk through that challenge from somebody shows up and they're not, there's no commercial transaction. There's a cost to doing the maintenance. How do you help somebody explain that, that part of the ecosystem? So that's really more from the uh, community point of view, right? It, that's you as a maintainer, you're feeling abused, I guess, um, taken for granted. Uh, yeah. and, and that's, we've always had freeloaders throughout all of free and open source software. I mean, free software has been around for nearly 40 years now. Open source software as of this year, 20 years. Freeloaders have always been a thing. That doesn't make it right. But it also shows that we haven't helped to we haven't done a good job within free and open source software to talk about the value we are providing. And so therefore mm. people do think it's free. They don't understand how much time goes into it. They don't understand how much effort goes into that Kubernetes. That's, you know, uh, virtual rebar, I think is what you call your product. Digital, right. Mm -hmm. Digital rebar. They don't understand what's involved with that. Now it's actually, that's, the situation is even cloudier because of the growth of corporate free and open source software, where you do have companies like Google and other massive companies um, supporting the development of certain free and open source software projects. Everyone assumes now that if you're a big project, you've got a lot of big companies paying for that. And so therefore, I can take advantage of it because it's just a big Pro, uh, big project that people are being paid for. So we haven't done a good job of communicating that, no, that's not actually the case. And this is this is not new. This is not uh, unique to free and open source software. You talk to any artist, any writer, any creator of any type, and they will tell you that, yeah, people are going to ask you to work for exposure. They're going to ask you to work for free. We just don't have a good sense of the empathy for the people at the other end and what's required of it. And, and I think and, that we and, can do better with that. And I think that there's there's a balance because one of the things that, that we see in our interactions is there's an element of I need to reach a certain level of capacity, understanding, empowerment in these projects, and then I might convert. Is right? Do you do you see that? Is it sort of a you know the I'm, I've got a it's not just a, a proof of concept or a trial. You know, you're actually you you have to have a reason to jump over into that that transition. Is that a, a fair? Or it is, it, do you do you see it as sort of this this chasm that people have to jump over as uh, they as they move into a project or think of a project differently? Uh, I'm not entirely sure of the what's on either side of the chasm you're using in your metaphor. To be honest, I think I must have lost that somewhere along the line. So let me let me back up and be specific because that'll that'll maybe be helpful. So if you have somebody, and I'm, I'm resisting putting in digital rebar terms, but maybe that'll just make it simpler and clearer. If somebody's doing boot provision with us and they want to do, you know, they, they have, they, they're like, yeah, I can, I can boot, boot a machine, but I want to do it this faster way that you've shown me, or I want to do it with multiple users, or I want to do it with some of these advanced features that require learning, right? Some, some expertise and often some investment from us as creators to show people how to do it. It's not the sell, it's not the easy, they've, they've ventured off of the easy path. And, and at that point, it becomes impossible to tell if that transition is a freeloader transition or a, I have to achieve enough expertise that I am ready to have, a, you know, I'm ready to move to the next level. Does that make sense? So sometimes. It, it, it does. I mean, some people so. become freeloaders not because they want to, but because they have to, right? We in free yeah. and open source mm -hmm. software have set the bar so high in so many cases that people just can't contribute. Um, and I have a entire talk, and I think maybe a couple of articles. I forget. I, I write too much um, about drive-through contributors. People who show up once, give you one contribution, and then they leave. And one of the most common reasons for them doing that, aside from assholes in your project, which is a different issue, is that you have made it so damn hard. 
that they do it once and they're, they're just like, peace out. I am never going through that again. Right. So we in free and open source software projects, we need to do a better job of showing what's involved in uh, contributing at all. So we can get that empathy of, oh crap, that's a ton of work. Maybe I do or don't want to get into it. But also, I mean, because you know, I mean, you've always, you've seen those expert people who just make everything look easy, right? So naturally people are going to think, oh, well, contributing is easy until we have done the work to show them otherwise. So if we give them that work and set up expectations up front, that will be, make it easier for them to self-select into whether they mm -hmm. want to even try, but also to support that, revelation of here's what work is required we have to provide the documentation we have to provide the way for people to self train into this and we do a rubbish job of that and we so can do what, better what does it look like when you do a good job i i can think of a couple things do you have like a list of or an example project that that's like really made it easier to to do a contribution and, and what did they do uh, so project I point at a lot. There's two of them. One is Pi Beware, um, so the Beware project in Python, and the other is Exorcism.io. That's ex like exercise, but with an ism on the end. So Exorcism.io. Um, both of them go well out of their way to make it easy for people to contribute. Not that the contribution itself is going to be easy because there's still work involved, right? And that work is not necessarily easy, but they pull open the coat curtains and they make it very clear. Here's everything you need to do. Here's where you can look for help. Here are all the steps. And here's what you can expect when you go to uh, make a contribution. It w we will try to get back to you in this amount of time. Um, you might get that sort of feedback. Here's our criteria for merging things. So they make everything very clear for the, the contributors. Um, and they do a really nice job, and they get a lot of contributors because of it. Plus, they're all really nice people, and that helps a lot, too. <laughs> I, authenticity is a big deal, right? Coming in, and, and even if you didn't like somebody's change, not blasting them for it. I, and what about CI/CD systems? Because that, that's one of the ones, to me, that can make a big difference, and it's an investment. I, I don't know that it makes that big of a change. Um, it does... Okay. Because a, an effective CI/CD system also requires you have effective tests, right? Right. Um, and that's its own thing. Separate from the CID, CI/CD system itself, you have to have people writing and maintaining effective tests. So do you add a gate on your, on your CI/CD that when you get a, a uh, push or a pull request that it has to have a test? Or I mean, how do you do that? How do you make sure that mm. you your CICD remains effective. Um, I don't see that as any sort of gate for contributions at all. If you have one and it's okay. effective and people can trust it, then yeah, they can see immediately whether their change meets a certain bar, right? Oh, this change is good. So when, when in my experience with, with especially as projects grow in complexity, any change has, has even a small change can have a domino effect. Um, and so it can become, it can be risky for the project maintainers to take pull requests because they don't, they, they have trouble anticipating the impact of a change. And so a good CI/CD system can help somebody, one, make sure they're not breaking anything, but it can reduce the burden for the maintainers of basically breaking, you know, risking a, a, a drive-by pull from breaking the project. And that is the case, but... I was speaking from the contributor point of view, right? You're okay. speaking from the maintainer point of view. These are completely uh, different perspectives. As a contributor, whether you have CI, CD, I don't care. I have a need. I have to fix this one thing or I have to level up in a certain skill and so I'm going to contribute for that. That's my need. You as a maintainer, you have a completely different risk profile and you have different needs. So right. as a maintainer, there are going to be different things that you require to make contributions easier and safer than the contributor needing. So, so you're describing something to me that there's a cognitive bias that, you know, from a consulting perspective, you, I mean, you're blowing my mind from being just immediately being able to switch it on and switch it off, right? When I approach most projects, I approach them as from a maintainer perspective, I guess, because just what, where I am most days. How do you help people, you know, Build empathy from on both sides of it. It it just like you do with 
any other situation where you're trying to build empathy and that's to raise awareness of what the other side is or may be going through right that's something that we have we as human beings not technologists but we as human beings have a very difficult time doing putting ourselves in someone else's shoes and we talk about it all the time but it's easy to say and difficult to do so you have to think about the other's perspective is this become a problem for these these corporations who are involved in open source that that they I guess I guess it's not the empathy isn't very natural or even more importantly the empathy with a competitor in the same project how do you express that in useful ways for people uh, it's it's not just the corporations I mean it's also on the maintainers and contributors side I mean the corporations don't understand what's really motivating these people to participate in free and open source software for free because they're not getting profit, right? So they don't understand that perspective. But the contributors and the maintainers, they're very suspicious of the corporations. And they don't understand right. that motivation. Why would they even participate? Oh my God, they're going to ruin it. We're gonna to totally sell out because look, a corporation is participating. Um, and, and so helping people understand each other's perspective. I, because I do walk that fine line. I, I, I'm on the business side, but I'm on the community side, and I can actually see what each one is trying to get at. And because I've been doing this for so long, I speak both languages. Okay. And that allows me to communicate each perspective in a language that the other side will understand. Some of these projects that we've been involved in, you named uh, Kubernetes, I think we named, yeah, we named Kubernetes and OpenStack. They, they have these huge corporate interests that are rival, they're now rival interests. How do you demark a safe playground? Is that at the corporate level, contributor level? With what is, you know, how do, how do people affect that? Um, that's usually done at a foundation level for something that's that huge. But one of the things I have a big problem with, like personally, my personal feelings on this is everybody talks about open source now as though it's a corporate thing mm. um, and that's not actually the case the massive i mean every time github comes out with a new state of the octaverse there are millions of new open repositories every single year on github alone that doesn't right. count GitLab. the vast majority of free and open source software projects out there are not the tensorflows the kubernetes the open stacks of the world and yet that's how we talk about it, and that's wrong. That's setting up an invalid set of expectations in the minds of people. This is a massive spectrum from the you know, mm. thousands of people maintaining an open stack, for instance, down to the single person maintaining that one NPM module on which your entire project relies, right? And so we can't get stuck thinking that this is a corporate thing, because it's not. From a consumption perspective, you're you're in the business of helping companies understand how to consume open source correctly too and be part of these communities and interpret the read the tea leaves for them i agree with you there's a huge spectrum is is there less concern for the one-off you know the, the, the that single contributor npm repository than there is for the the, the thousand contributor infrastructure project well, that's one of the things we have to talk through all the time is uh, often they just don't have any sense of the landscape that they're using, that they're existing in, the overall ecosystem of free and open source software that allows their company to survive. They might know the big names, but they don't know those little things that are completely mm. vital to their software. And so we have to do an assessment. Well, here is all the stuff that you are using. And here are the things that are just sort of handy, and here are the things that actually matter. How many of the things on that actually matter list were you aware of? If okay. anything happens to these things, and it could be, again, a small Python module, an NPM module, you know, what have you. If anything happens to one of those, what happens to your business? Let's talk about that. Okay, now let's talk about how we can make sure that doesn't happen. And every single company, every product, every project will have a separate risk model so you have sure. to look at that but doesn't that just drive people then into saying ah, i'm scared just red hat me i'm done uh it may but okay. then you look at the price tag of red hat and you decide that maybe it might be more cost effective to do it yourself 
or maybe not. I can't make that decision. You have to figure out what, again, your risk model, your, your price sensitivity, your needs. That's something that's going to vary for every single company. So, so when people make a decision like that, does that then effectively pull them out of the community, right? If, if somebody says, you know what, I, I, I don't want to mess with that. I'm just going to pay a vendor. They're going to handle it for me. What's the, what's the price from the community's perspective when people put these barriers or buffers in place between them and the, the actual communities? It depends on where they're throwing their money, right? I mean, if they give it to Red Hat, Red Hat is actually, and, and full disclosure, I got no skin of this game. I am not a Red Hat employee, but they do a really great job of contributing upstream to the vast majority of open source projects that they rely on. And that's mm -hmm. a lot of them. They do default to upstream first. So right. if you're giving Red Hat your money, yeah, the community is going to benefit. If you're giving it to someone else, I don't know. But also you got to look at what are your needs? If you're giving your money to one of these companies, yeah, that might cover a portion of the free and open source software on which you rely, but it's not going to cover the rest. It's not going to cover, you know, your angulars of the world. It's not going to cover some of these other things that you might rely on for your company. So you have to take that assessment and figure out where to put your support. And what does that support even look like? It might not be money. It might be something completely else, but I can't but answer that for you. And, and so do you think that companies who are consuming open source from that perspective should adopt a policy of I'm going to pay into the communities? Just is that, does that become part of the, you know, I, if I'm consuming software, I need to make sure that there's a net balance somewhere, that, they're, they're, that I am funding it, or that I'm not being a freeloader? There's my personal perspective, and then there's the perspective of my clients. So okay. my personal perspective is you... Give credit where credit is due and you support the people who are helping to lift you up. If that means that you contribute to free and open source software in whatever way contribution, in whatever form contribution takes, does not have to be code, does not have to be mm -hmm. money. There are many ways to contribute. If that means that's how you do it, great. If from your personal business perspective, that doesn't make any sense, we're going to have a strong conversation about that if you have brought me on as a consultant and we will talk about it. And if it turns out that it does not make sense from your business perspective and your culture to contribute to and support free and open source software that way, that's great. You will have come to that conclusion. And then our, uh, our relationship as a consultant and employer will also have come to its conclusion. Yeah, makes sense. Which is so fine, right? That's their decision. They're free to make it. I agree. And I struggle with this because, right, I participate in a lot of these communities on both sides. I never feel like I'm, I'm putting enough back in that I'm getting. And I guess that's a, that means, you know, that's, I think, hopefully everybody sort of feels that there's, there's more they could put back. I, I, I guess I think of a business continuity problem. If I'm depending on these communities of people to create things that I depend on, but I'm not making sure that they're healthy. And, and you're right. It's not just monetary health. It's yeah. notoriety, it's visibility, it's bugs, it's documentation. It's oh, I'm 100% behind you. I'm more than 100% behind you. Um, okay. I wrote an article in Linux Journal um, in May, I believe, maybe June. I forget. Time has no meaning. But um, <laughs> it's, I just, I recently posted it to my blog, um, anonymoushash.vmversor.com. And it's all about how free and open source software needs to be a part of your corporate sustainability plan because you do have this pipeline of things that you rely on and your business relies on. And if you're not supporting it, hell, if you're not even aware of it, then you're putting yourself at risk and your company at risk and all of your employees and their welfare at risk. So you must look at free and open source software as a part of the things that you have to support, just like the environment, just mm -hmm. like the welfare of your employees. That's something you have to invest in for the best benefit of your company. And, and if you don't and, see that, I can't make you see that because you're obviously just going to fail and that's your problem. Well, this is, this to me, so when, when I was at Dell and we were, we, we were spinning up a whole bunch, this is in, in the pre-open stack days, and it ties into what, you were, what you're describing. We would work, build up a new project with a, with a company, often a startup. The very act of us being engaged with that startup would then lead to it getting acquired, often by a competitor. And that whole, all the work we did to bring that project up just went away. And, and I see vendors today having less continuity of support for projects that they do than open source. 
from that perspective. So mm -hmm. right, you're talking about business continuity. The likelihood of an open source project you know, disappearing off the face of the earth is pretty low compared to uh, some, what, some of the vendors' software. Actually. Exactly, yeah. Um, I mean, you never can tell, frankly, when somebody's going to be acquired, when they will completely crater, when they will suddenly decide they want to go to the evil side and start selling all of your data and you disagree with it, so you have to pull mm. out. You know, you don't know that. But with free and open source software, especially things that are under copyleft licenses, you are guaranteed that that will always be there. And you are guaranteed that you will always be able to use it yourself, contribute to it yourself, modify it yourself, fork it if you need to, but it will always be there. So that's one of the massive advantages of copyleft software in particular for business continuity. You can always rely on it being there. That's a big deal. That's a, you know, it doesn't mean it's free. You might have to pay a lot of, a lot of effort to make that, that work, but it's definitely, from a continuity perspective, a very strong argument. Absolutely. Yeah, do you want to define copyleft for us? Do What's I want to mean? define copyleft? Oh, um, yeah. oh, I am so rubbish at this. This is what I rely on. <laughs> Uh, on my free software friends for defining. Um, so we all know what copyright is. Answer, no, we don't know what copyright is. Um, <laughs> so copyright, as a creator, you have the right to create, to use copies of it, right? And you get to tell other people how they can use your thing, be it art, be it music, be it what have you. Um, copy left is where you retain the copyright. You still get to define how people use it, but how you have defined that is you are free to do these four things, and those four things are the four freedoms as defined by Richard Stallman. Um, and I'm always rubbish at uh, listing them off. I am a bad free. We can, we can include, we'll include a link to Stallman in the show notes. That's yeah, easy. Yeah, uh, well, just link to the four freedoms because Stallman is problematic lately and says, <laughs> um, and I'll, I will go on record as saying that that man is a loose cannon. <laughs> Copyleft ensures that forever that one thing will always have the four freedoms, the freedoms to uh, study, modify, distribute. Um, and there's a fourth one that I always blend in there. And whereas other open source software licenses can be changed, so you can take something and, and put a different license on it for certain things, um, for copyleft you can't. Copyleft software must always be distributed under the exact same rules as those that you received it under. So copyleft licenses ensure that the software will always be copyleft, which means it ensures it is always available for you as a company. Linux, very good example of something that's under copyleft license. Which like, so AGPL, GPL type software, different yeah. than Apache. So uh, maybe this will end up a simple conversation, but uh, open core is a, is a model where parts of the software are open source. Um, enterprise capabilities typically are kept proprietary or extended into the software. You have, do, you have, do you have a fundamental concern with that? Do you see that as, a, as, as a part of a spectrum for people? Um, well, it is kind of part of a spectrum. I mean, obviously, my, my personal belief is I would like everything to be free. But I also very much like companies to remain solvent. So I understand that you can't necessarily create something and then release it all into the wild for free because you might not be able to support your company and your employees in that way. And that's irresponsible as a business owner. However, you can take baby steps. You can start with open core so you're, until your business becomes well-founded and very established, and then you can start opening up other things. So I think having this all open, all not, that dichotomy is, that's irresponsible from us and free and open source software, right? We have to allow people to take baby steps and to move slowly but surely towards our beliefs. You know, being dogmatic about it, that's just gonna push people away and we will never get them to open their stuff. And actually, I think you're, you're right. The, the key problem in open source that I see a lot is dogmatism. Yeah. I like your pragmatism here. One of the things for us, when we look at uh, open versus held back, because some stuff we hold back is still open, it's, it's a matter of art protecting our time so that people don't, don't run with scissors. And to me, that there's an element uh, with, with open core models of saying these are things that add complexity into the project. 
that aren't for casual observers. Is that does that make sense? Not really. No. I, no? I, okay. Open core, it's it's open. It's out there, right? Um, right. And it sounds like the things you were discussing are things that you have held back because they could add additional overhead burden to the team or to support or what have you. And those things would remain closed just because, I don't know, it's kind of like a restaurant having 20 tables and only having 10 of them served because they don't have the staff to seat all 20 of them. Mm. And to me, it seems like I know open core is those 10 tables that you are serving and you have put out there, but once you're able to support more tables, once you get more weight staff on, then you can start opening up more tables and by releasing new things because you'll have the staff to support them. That's what it kind of seems like you're saying. I, I, I like that analogy. The other, the other side of it for, for us and the way we look at it, and I think the way I see good projects doing it, is that if you can create some self-service options so that those, those first tables require less load, then you can open up more tables. I actually really like this this analogy, right? Because you know, there's a commercial component to open core where you're saying I need to make money and I need a barrier to to trigger that making money. But there's also a time element to governing your project, right? To providing real support and helping people be successful. Um, so I like this restaurant analogy. It's it's a smart one. It's I. Uh just kind of pulled that out of my butt. But let's go with it. I like it. I'm going to try to remember this and use it again. Um, but really, open core is nothing new. We've been doing this for as long as we've had free and open source software that's at all commercial. MySQL did it, and everyone else did it. You'd have dual licensing, or you'd have a community version and an enterprise version. Open core is just another flavor of the same thing we've been doing the entire time in free and open source software. It's a buzzword. It's a handy buzzword. And frankly, a friend of mine, uh, Michael Downey, he works at the UN on digital. Oh, I forget. But he works at the UN on free and open source software. Great guy. He was asking the other day, what do you call the opposite? What do you call those, say you have a proprietary piece of software, and then you have the free and open source bits that accrete around it. What do you call mm -hmm. those? It's the opposite of open core. I, and I call, I consider that a um, connector library, right? Those are those are ecosystem plugins, and and that's a really common model too, Isn't where you it? have yeah. a proprietary product where you have a whole bunch of of, of plugins and extensions. Like Am I mean, Amazon, Google, Microsoft, they have SDKs that are open, where they should be. If they're not, they're crazy. Um, yeah. And so they have SDKs that access their serv their services closed as heck. Um, <laughs> Um, but the but all of that surrounding piece is is open. Yeah, and I mean, be, right. It help, only helps them to do that. It, it does only help them, and that's why you know you've got Apple opening up Swift. It made amazing sense for them to do something like that from a business perspective to open up Swift. But even for all iOS development, you know, you've got all these libraries and utilities that are free and open source software built on Swift or you know Cocoa or what have you. But they're open sourced, right? And you've got uh, the Unity game engine that itself is source available, not open source. But there are tools around it that are open. And so we've got this handy little buzzword of open core now. What's our handy little buzzword for the other stuff? What's the other side of that coin called? And that's I, would call, I would call those SDKs, but that's the... Yeah, ooh, uh, SDK ooh, is the thing that enables all of the other little bits to be created. Anyway, it was a very interesting <laughs> conversation that uh, that Michael brought up the other day, and it's something that's I've been tossing the back of my head and thinking of from time to time. I like it. Good question. Yeah, he's a great guy. So, yeah, brilliant. So, so Vicky and Rob, this is my time, and everyone's always like, "Really?" Because when we do these <laughs> podcasts, right, Bob, everyone, I go, "We can go 30, 30 50 minutes. We go thirty. We'll never go more than that." And as usual, we're in the nearing fifty minute range. But uh, Vicky, fantastic. I know you have a new book coming out. I oh, yeah. It's called Forge, Forge Your Future with Open Source. Is that correct? Yes. It's, it's done now. We're in post-production. Um, it's on Pragmatic Programmers. It is in hard copy in September, but it's available right now in beta at Pragmatic Programmers, so pragprog.com. It is the first and only book about how to contribute to free and open source software. And this is for you as an individual. You want to contribute to open source, where do you even get started? How do you do that? Well, step one, you pick up this book. 
because it will give you all of the other steps. So follow you Twitter, any other places? I know you have a website as well. So my blog is anonymous hash, all one word, dot vmbrasore.com, or you can just go to vmbrasore.com and there's a link there to, that will take you over there. Uh, Twitter is the best place to follow me, really. So uh, just at vmbrasore. Pretty much if you see a vmbrasore anywhere online and it's not me, I want to know because I need to go smack someone. <laughs> and, and I think we're going to get this out because you're going to be speaking at the Open Source Summit at the end of the month in Vancouver. I, it's been a long time. I will be there as well. It's been a while since I've been to Open Source event. So we'll get this out uh, early. So if you're listening to this and you like uh, what I think you had to say, we, you know, go search her out in Vancouver. You know, and search out myself. I'll be there. And uh, possibly maybe we'll get some uh, podcasts live from the event as well. So Vicki and Rob, thanks for joining us. Really appreciate it. Fantastic open source podcast. And I uh, look forward to talking to both of you again in the near future. Excellent. Thank you so much, Stephen and Rob. This has been fun. Excellent. Thank you.